Welcome everyone to the tonight's uh, installment of the Longfellow House Washington's headquarters 2021 virtual fall lecture series. We're going to hear from Nicole Mullen on disability at home in early America. Uh, my name is John Bell. I'm with the Friends of Longfellow House Washington's headquarters. Uh, during this talk, you will see a, a picture of Alice Longfellow in her father's study and we are currently in a fundraising campaign to restore that study. Uh, so uh, if you see the window seats that she's sitting by, we want to make those look as uh, handsome as they did when her father was using that room. So if you are interested in helping out, please check out our website at friendsoflongfellowhouse.org. And uh, we are also, of course, happy to support events like this and the summer festival and other lectures at Longfellow House Washington's headquarters. So thank you very much for being part of tonight's event. And now I'm going to turn over the screen to uh, Emily Levine, our supervisory park ranger at the house, who will introduce our speaker. Wonderful. Thank you, John. Um, thank you to the friends of the Longfellow House Washington's headquarters, um, as always, for helping to make these talks possible. and. Thank you to all of you. It's um, wonderful to get to see some folks on their little Zoom boxes um, over and over again throughout this series. So whether you are joining us for the first time or returning, thank you so much for being here this evening. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. So as folks have seen, we are recording this evening. This uh, lecture will be available on our YouTube channel shortly after. Um, but that means that if you do have your webcam on, your face may, uh, may appear in the recording this evening. So just something to keep in mind there. Um, in just a moment, I will introduce our speaker for the evening. She's going to um, give her talk and afterwards we will um, have time available for a question and answer session. So if you have questions throughout the talk, please feel free to pop those into the chat and we'll get to them afterwards. Um, I'll also invite folks if you'd prefer to just come off mute at the end and we can have a little bit of conversation. Um, also importantly, we do have live captioning available during this event. Um, I am just now putting a link to that into the chat. So if you'd like to utilize those live captions, the link is available in the chat. Um, all right, without further ado, I'm really excited to introduce tonight's speaker. Um, Nicole Belolan, uh, PhD, is the public historian in residence at the Mid-Atlantic Regional Center for the Humanities at Rutgers University, Camden. Uh, there, she's the co-editor of the Public Historian and the digital media editor for the National Council on Public History. Uh, at Rutgers, she directs a continuing education program in historic preservation and regularly lectures on disability history, as well as giving workshops on accessibility best practices for small museums and historic sites. Um, Nicole Belolan is also the secretary of the Disability History Association. And um, again, we're tremendously excited to hear from her this evening. So um, again, without further ado, I will hand it over to Nicole. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for being here tonight. It's uh, thrilling to have been invited. I am going to share my screen with you so you can see the slides that I have prepared. So just give me one moment while I queue that up. And one more moment while I put it in presenter mode. All right, excellent. So I think Emily is going to put a copy of my talk into the chat and feel free to open that and follow along while we are here together tonight or later if you want. There are some extra, some extras in there, some hyperlinks that you can click on to learn more about what I'm talking about. So thank you again uh, so much uh, for having me here tonight to talk about disability history. I am happy to say I did have an opportunity to visit the Longfellow House a few years ago, and I wish I had had more time to spend there. I had a really short tour after a, a workshop I was participating in. 
but it's nice to sort of be there in spirit with all of you. Uh, I'm gonna describe myself so uh, you know what I look like. I'm a white woman in my mid thirties with long brown hair and glasses sitting in my house. This is my home office and behind me, maybe if I move, you can see a chair with brightly colored printed fabric and a part of my crutch collection, which we can talk about if you would like. Before diving in, I want to note that I'll be using contemporary words to refer to disabled people in history. So for example, the word disabled. I'll also be using some historic terms that we might find offensive today, but I'll only use those when I'm citing historic sources. Language, including disability related language is constantly evolving. And you'll see some of that reflected in this talk. And I'm happy for that to be a part of our conversation as well. You'll notice a few things about my presentation that are designed to make it as, as, as accessible as possible for disabled participants, but also just about anyone. When I first started giving talks at academic conferences about disability history, I learned a lot from people in the field. Many people who study disability history also identify as disabled and or disability activists and advocates. And so I learned a lot about how to make presentations more accessible for audiences. But you'll find that these measures are helpful for everyone, even if you don't identify as disabled. For starters, uh, thank you so much to the Longfellow House for helping out with this. They hired a professional live captioner. Uh, you should all try the captions if you have a chance. You'll see they're much more accurate than what some critics, critics have referred to as craptions, C-R-A-P-T-I-O-N-S, which refers to auto-generated captions. So if you think I'm speaking a little slowly, that's due in part so the captioner can keep up though they're professionals and I'm sure uh, have worked with speakers who speak a lot faster. But I also hope it makes what I'm talking about tonight easier to process for all of us. Or maybe if you even, if you aren't deaf or hard of hearing, but you are in a setting at home where you can't turn up the sound, the captions would be helpful for you there too. So Emily already put uh, what's called an access copy of my talk into the chat. If you prefer to follow along with the text, please go ahead. It includes the images I'm using in the slides as well as some bonus material. I hyperlinked some text you can read more now or later. I'll describe all the images on the screen in full. And this of course is necessary if anyone in the audience is blind or has low vision, but it also usually helps me be a more effective presenter too. Finally, uh, allow yourself to get the most out of this by doing whatever it is you want to do during this talk, knit, make dinner, stretch, take notes, play with your cats, what have you. As we go along, if there is something else I can do to make this presentation easier to follow, please let me know. And Emily might need to uh, yell at me in case that is what's, what's happening. So some background. When Emily, uh, the supervisory park ranger for interpretation, oh, and I forgot, thank you to JL Bell for helping out with Zoom tonight. Um, when Emily got in touch with me and asked if I might be interested in participating in this series, she mentioned that the Longfellow House recently started to explore some of its own disability history associated with Alice Longfellow, who I did not know until now. She lived from 1850 to 1928. And this first slide gives the title of my talk and my email address. You're welcome to send me a note at nicole.belolan at records.edu. Well, let's get back to Alice. This slide shows a photograph of her from the Longfellow House website. Uh, it was taken around 1925, sepia toned. Alice is seen sitting in a big wing chair. She's, uh, her right side is facing a window where the curtains are drawn so there's sh sun shining through. And she has her head leaned a little bit on two of her fingers, which I feel shows a lot of fun personality shining through and she has a fern, I think a big, big potted fern behind her. And um, 
as Emily and I chatted on Zoom, she told me more about Alice and noted that when Alice got older, she had arthritis and used a wheelchair from time to time and added an elevator to the Longfellow house in the early 20th century to make it easier to get from one floor to another. This is a screenshot from the Park Service website titled Architectural Adaptation and ex explains how, or the fact that during Alice's lifetime, the family added an elevator and it's pictured on the right-hand side and the door to the elevator is uh, very traditional architectural in nature and it matches the, uh, the cabinetry in the room. Now, most people in the past and even today if they have difficulty climbing stairs, they don't add elevators to their home for all the reasons we can imagine, cost and space, for example. But people did interact with objects and people and spaces in ways that are interesting to think about and tell us a lot about the lived experience of physical disability in early America. I don't know a whole lot about Alice's experiences with disability at home, or even whether she would have considered herself disabled I would love to research her sometime, but I can provide some insights into how some other people I'm more familiar with, at least historically, managed and lived with disability at home in the 18th and early 19th centuries. I'm also gonna talk a bit about why disability history remains a topic you might not have heard a whole lot about. First, I wanna talk a little bit about disability today. About one in four or five, depending on the source, Americans identifies as disabled. And yet we don't seem to see a proportionate number of disabled people represented in popular culture, such as advertisements and movies, let alone history books. Though my historian colleagues and I are working on this, you can check out, for example, a great exhibition at the Smithsonian co coordinated by Catherine Ott. It's linked in that access copy. I'm not the first person to point this out, though, and if you want to learn more about the perspective of disabled people today, I highly recommend you check out Alice Wong's edited volume, that's A-L-I-C-E-W-O-N-G. It's called Disability Visibility, and it's a whole series of fascinating essays about what it's like to be disabled in today's world. Now, despite the uptick in advocacy for disabled people, about including disabled people at the table, so to speak, um, it's not the norm. So that raises the question, what happened to make many of us not think about disability today, let alone as a thing with the history? What happened to make some people forget to include disabled people in public life? Um, there are many examples of this happening in the world today. One recent one being the design of a new public library in New York, there are several times uh, stories that were run in the New York Times about this. So for example, people complained that they weren't able to independently access some of the book stacks, whether they were wheelchair users or people using strollers because the only way you could get to them was through a flight of stairs. Now it's quite possible the library has since fixed some of these issues, but I'm just giving you one example of uh, how that, that plays out sometimes. Now, let me give you some historical perspective on this. Unfortunately, there have been many examples of people perpetuating what we call ableism, which is a preference for able-bodied people. Many disabled people historically were shut out, shut away, or separated or excluded from other people in the recent past. I'm gonna give you a couple reading recommendations in case you wanna learn more about this from people who are experts in these particular topics. So for example, if you wanna learn more about how immigration laws in the late 19th and early 20th centuries restricted immigration of disabled people, check out Douglas Baton's book, Defectives in the Land. If you wanna more, learn more about forced incarceration of people in institutions, check out Kim Nielsen's Money, Marriage and Madness or Susan Birch's Unspeakable, The Story of Junius Wilson. Those are all linked and mentioned in that access copy. Other reasons we don't necessarily think to include disabled people is due to the use of the term special to single out and separate students, for example, in educational settings. Think of the phrase special education. I could go on with more examples, but I wanted to provide just a few so you know why we are, why 
we are where we are today. Why, when I originally proposed this topic for my PhD research, some people didn't think there would be evidence for disability before the 20th or 19th century, or even that it would be of interest. What I find so intriguing is that the time period I do focus on, the 1700s and the early 1800s, disabled people were very, were much more visible and integrated into everyday life than I think compared to today. You might get the impression that I'm suggesting that disabled people in early America were never marginalized. And that's not the case or the point I wanna make. I do want to explain that the context was very different. Compared to today, early America was much more flexible materially and socially. And I think the examples I'll provide in a few minutes will help fill in some of those details. Now that I've briefly covered why seeing disabled people in popular culture and disability history are relatively new or unusual today, I wanna to talk a bit about what elites did at home to live with and manage disability when they were disabled at home. And I think you'll see some connections to Alice's experience in the Longfellow House. Talking about this history is in and of itself a way to change the contemporary conversation about access and inclusion. So now I'm gonna go through three, uh, I'm calling them vignettes about disability in early America using a couple examples from my research. It was hard to choose, but we're gonna start with, uh, oops, James Logan. So this is a portrait of James Logan by Thomas Sully after a late 17th century portrait by uh, Gusta, uh, by Hazelius. And it's in the collection at the Library Company of Philadelphia. James Logan lived from 1674 to 1751 and is best known as the secretary of William Penn. And he is pictured here uh, in a portrait with a gold frame. There's a two-tone brown background and his outfit matches the background. He is wearing a probably what we call a banyan, which is a form of um, casual dress you might wear at home in the, the late 17th, uh, early 18th century and a white shirt. And it looks like probably a wig and he's facing, he's looking at, at, at you, looking at us. <laughs> um, now what's his story? So. What I find interesting about James Logan, lots of people study his um, interaction with indigenous people or his business dealings. Um, but what I did when I went through his many, many letters is look for information about uh, what happened to him one day in 1728. He walked outside the house where he was living in Philadelphia, probably what is known as the Slate Roof House. If you're familiar with Philadelphia, it's across from City Tavern. He slipped on a patch of ice and he fell on his side. And a bottle of, I think, gout ointment shattered in his pocket. And I think at the time he thought that that shattering of the glass uh, had done a lot of damage to his, his hip or his thigh. It seems that he did much more damage though. He probably broke or dislocated his hip. Um, many of us have fallen, myself included. Hopefully you've recovered quickly and had no broken bones. But that's not what happened to Logan. He, in fact, wrote about having servants, some of whom may have been enslaved, move his bedstead immediately from the upstairs to the first floor of his home. And there he stayed for a few weeks. And he wrote uh, very colorfully about moving his tip in and out of its socket. And we know a lot about how this fall affected Logan's life because he wrote about it many, many times. He wrote about it to almost every person he sent the letter to. Uh, and there were many, until he died in 1751. And along the way, strokes further complicated his physical and cognitive relationship to the world. When he moved to his country house, Stenton, which you can still visit, it's on the outskirts of Philadelphia, now part of Philadelphia in Germantown. When he moved to Stenton a few years after the fall, he continued to sleep on the first floor and wrote often about being, in his words, confined to crutches or a cripple. So that's our first vignette. The second one, now we're now looking at a portrait of a man in a wheelchair. Uh, we don't know who he is or who painted him. It's from about 1805 based on his clothing. And it's actually in my collection. It's, it's in my 
my dining room, in fact, and he is sitting in a wheelchair with leather uh, upholstered arms and he's carrying a handkerchief in his right hand. He, his body is facing mostly to his left and he's looking at all of us. Sometimes I feel like he's smiling at me and sometimes I feel like he's scowling at me. <laughs> Depends on my mood or maybe his mood, I'm not sure. Um, we know far less about this man than we know about James Logan. Like I said, we don't even know who he was, but there is a lot that we can glean from the portrait itself. Um, as far as I know, it's the earliest portrait of a Euro-American using a wheelchair. Because he was using a wheelchair, we can probably guess he had some sort of physical impairment and he wanted to be remembered using his wheelchair. Wheelchairs at the time usually were called chairs with wheels. Some things about this portrait we might ask include, why did he use his handkerchief? Was it related to anything associated with why he was using his wheelchair? How often did he use his wheelchair? Did he use it all the time, only for certain circumstances? One of the things we can assume based on other chairs with wheels made in this era is that it was likely made by a local chair maker or a cabinet maker or a family member may have even adapted an existing chair to make it into this chair with wheels. And I think we can also assume based on the way he is dressed that this man had some means. He is wearing jewelry, for example, you can see a little heart-shaped uh, shirt pin on his uh, upper chest. Also, this is a big portrait. It is about three feet by four feet. So this was not um, you know, just a, a small portrait that he had commissioned. Now the next vignette, I'm calling it, is about adult cradles. We're looking at a, a plain a wooden adult cradle. It's a color photograph of the adult cradle in situ at a historic house in Shrewsbury, Massachusetts. These adult cradles were objects um, people used from 1780 to 1840 to live with and manage acute and chronic disability of various kinds in home settings. Most of the cradles you find in museums today were associated with women. They are also often uh, found in Quaker, uh, excuse me, Shaker settings. The person who used this cradle was named Martha Ward. She lived from 1724 to 1794 and used it at home. The house where, that you're looking at now, you can still visit it. It's the Artemis Ward house named after her father who directed her brother to care for her. And now people wrote very little about these cradles in the period. So we really have to rely on the objects themselves as sources to tell us about what it was like to be disabled. Adult cradles fascinate people. They fascinate me. They're the first thing I went off to study when I was first doing the research for my dissertation. People uh, who I talk to about adult cradles, uh, especially when we're in person, um, they usually look at them and think they look like coffins and that they must have been confining. But in fact, they were neither, I believe. I tried out a reproduction of one at the Fruitlands Museum in Massachusetts. And while I know I can never truly replicate the experience of using one historically for many reasons, for instance, I don't identify as disabled, I can tell you that you can see a lot from inside these cradles, especially if they had the full amount of bedding that you would have seen in them historically. This one just has a single quilt in it. Um, and also many of them have handles. This one does not, but it's not super big, but it's these are relatively light objects. They're easily movable throughout the house. And that meant that people who use them could easily remain surrounded by family and friends at home. I said there were three vignettes. I meant that there were four, my apologies. One more, we're gonna talk, I don't have a slide for it, but we're gonna talk about uh, Nathan and crutches. Um, this is a vignette from a newspaper advertisement from 1799. It's, I'm going to quote briefly from a runaway ad. If you're not familiar with runaway ads, people placed them in newspapers in early America. They were usually descriptions of their servants or enslaved people, and the pur purpose was to get them back because they were running away. 
So they often included descriptions of clothing, people's bodies, sometimes uh, their personalities, what they might've been carrying with them. Really fascinating primary sources. You could read them all day and find something interesting in every single one. So let me quote briefly from this one. It's from a Baltimore newspaper. Absconded from the subscriber, living in the city of Baltimore, a Negro man named Nathan, about 29 years of age, nine feet, 10 inches high. One leg is of no use to him in walking, it being withered, and very little larger than his arm. He hops along upon a crutch and a shoemaker by trade, a good, strong workman, carried off with him a set of tools. And there's more to the ad than that, but that gives you a good sense of what, what the tone is like for these ads. This advertisement tells us a lot about disability too. It raises questions about the relationship between labor and physical ability. We learn that in contrast to James Logan, the first guy I talked about, some people didn't necessarily feel confined to crutches as James Logan put it, but instead Nathan was using one to get out, to get away. And of course this advertisement provides a stark contrast to the lives of middling and elite people I focused on for the first part of my examples. So what do these three short vignettes tell us about disability in early America? Are there any similarities between the lived experience of James Logan, the man in the wheelchair, Martha Ward and others who used adult cradles, Nathan, an enslaved person who ran away with the crutch? Are there any similarities between their lived experience and that of disabled people today? Are there any differences? You can probably um, glean some of them yourself, but I'll, I'll just mention a few. I think they show how diverse the experience of disability could be, particularly when you compare, say, James Logan, an elite white man, and Nathan, an enslaved Black person. Class and race mattered when it came to how you managed and live with disability, and the same is true today. I think these examples also show how disabled people in this period relied on, to some extent, improvisation, making do with what you have at hand. Logan, for example, managed his injury in part by turning his living room into a bedroom. Or in the case of adult cradles, people fashioned interesting creative solutions using what they had around the house. And improvisation is also a common theme today. In the access copy in this section, I linked a really great website called Engineering at Home. It's about a woman uh, actually from the Boston area who uh, improv, improv, excuse me, improvises a lot with things around the house. I think these vignettes also highlight how people can live with and manage different types of disability at the same time. Logan, for example, fell, but later had several strokes. Some people who used the cradles may have had physical as well as, well as cognitive impairments. It's easy to think of types of disability separately and that certainly makes research easier, but it does not necessarily reflect lived experience. If you were wealthy, you really needed other people too, servants, family, enslaved people to help you get around. Logan did not move on his own in the first few days of his injury, as you can imagine. In fact, people moved him, he describes in detail about how they slid a piece of fabric under him to help him uh, move in bed. These vignettes also show show us that medicine is often not a part of disability in this period. That's one of the things that surprises people the most about disability when I talk to them about disability in early America. People often immediately start thinking of medicine and people in this period did see doctors. Logan wrote about seeing multiple doctors and trying to figure out how he can um, manage living with whatever it was he did to his hip. But a lot of the experience of disability is also about uh, material, um, living with it materially and figuring out uh, how, how to, to get around. And so, for example, the bedstead, the wheelchair, the cradles, the crutches, these all would have been made by people who worked with wood, not an engineer or a medical supply company. People would have acquired these objects from uh, chair makers, for example, uh, carpenters of some kind and they would have been maintained by these people or other people in the household. 
And all the examples show that in this time period, disabled people were not necessarily or were not often at all hidden away. Uh, Logan remained in touch via correspondence with perhaps dozens of people. The man who used a wheelchair and had his portrait painted wanted to be seen and remembered. And the people who used the cradles, the objects themselves helped them stay integrated within their household. Nathan, who was running away using a crutch, and many others like him would have been quite visible on the street and in other public places. So disabled people were not shut away. That became more common in the 19th and 20th centuries, but even then was not the sole experience of disability. Uh, for many people, uh, this is the first thing they asked me about when I talk about disability in early America. Oh, well, weren't lots of people shut away? And that wasn't the case. I think the, some of the examples I showed today provide a different story. So I'm going to conclude now with a few short words about uh, today and why we're talking about all this. Why does it matter? You might think that uh, the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, which proceed, was preceded by a lot of civil rights advocacy by disabled people and their allies around the same, same time period that uh, we had the civil rights movement for African-Americans, women, and indigenous people, you might think that the Americans with Disabilities Act helped fix or stop discrimination against disabled people. But as you've probably gathered based on the historic and contemporary examples of ableism I have shared, that's not the case. In fact, most disability advocates will say that the ADA is just a baseline and only the beginning. And that's why I like to make my own practice of history, whether I'm giving a talk like this one or planning a conference, accessible and inclusive for everyone. And one big piece of that is researching and sharing disability history itself. So I'm uh, thrilled to be here to take questions and have a conversation and um, talk more. Great, thank you so much. And um, now we'd just like to invite folks to take a minute to think about questions that you might have. Um, feel free to pop those into the chat or um, just take yourself off mute if you have a comment or a question and we can get a little bit of discussion going. Uh, we have a question from Lisa in the chat, which was, um, what was the year of the runaway ad you shared and who placed the ad? So um, any additional context that you know for that? Yeah, my pleasure. It was 1799. It was published in um, a newspaper in Baltimore, Maryland called the American and Daily Advertiser on page eight. I don't have the full text in front of me, so I can't tell you who placed the ad. It was probably the person who owned uh, the enslaved person. But if you want me to look up the full text, I'm happy to do that. You can just send me send me an email. Um, and I thank you. And I, I think I, I'm sorry I missed a question from Joe, which is um, how did gender interact with disability historically? Ah, great question. Um, in many ways, um, <laughs> one of um, the things I've studied is uh, the history of gout, which is a disabling form of arthritis you might be familiar with or you might have heard of. Um, we think of it as an 18th century disease, but millions of people have it today too. And one of the interesting things about gout is that lots of people made fun of people with gout because some of the people who were most visibly, um, who most visibly had gout were rich white guys. And the assumption was that they only got gout because they um, had extravagant lifestyles. We know today, medically, that like many diseases, there are many reasons why a person could develop gout. Uh, lifestyle is only one of them. At any rate, a lot of the satire associated with gout is um, sort of infantilizing and um, in some ways, making men seem um, weak in some ways and, and not you know, a manly um, uh, ideal of the time period. There are many other great studies on gender. Um, it's not my area of expertise, but that's, that's one of them. And I have um, published a short chapter on that if you wanna check that out. Thank you. 
Um, another question that just came in here, which is um, what about people without means and how did they deal with disability? Excellent question. Yeah. And I think um, Nathan, the runaway enslaved man, is a great example of that. Um, he didn't have very much, and he, but he did have a crutch and he was, he was getting away with it. Um, it really depends on the context. You know, some people uh, were independent, like Nathan, for at least a time. There were in large urban areas, uh, sometimes private, sometimes public, sometimes private public, hospitals and almshouses where poor people could go for assistance of various kinds. And that would often include uh, provisioning of crutches or artificial limbs or that sort of thing. So, uh, and in Philadelphia in the early 19th century, at least there was a system in which people could get assistance from the city in their own homes and people went to their homes to provide assistance to them. So oftentimes you had people who were poor and were also disabled or sick. So it depended on the situation. And then of course you also have servants and enslaved people who lived in homes with people with means, in which case they were often taken care of. So it depends on, on the context. Thank you. We've got some really great questions coming in. So um, I'm going to, I might jump around a little bit, but um, let's see. Um, if, I'm, if I'm jumping around, I will come back to you. So I'm um, a question from Emily. Have you noticed uh, differences in the way the historical record depicts people who were disabled since birth uh, versus people who became disabled later in life? Well, that's a great question. Um trying to think. Most of the people I have studied acquired their disabilities at some point in their lifetimes. Um, I, as you could tell, and as I don't think I made super explicit, I focus primarily on physical disability. It all, um, so it kind of, so I don't know actually a whole lot about people being born with disabilities and what that was like. So for example, I don't study um, for the most part, uh, people who were blind, who might've been blind at birth. Um, I can tell you that disability and the way people were treated often depended on sometimes the disability itself, but sometimes whether or not other people liked them or if what made them disabled, for example, gout, um, if that particular disease had some sort of stigma attached to it. So, I hate to sound like a broken record, but it really depended on the person and the disability and the context, um, which is one thing that makes it, I think, a really interesting uh, topic to study. It is so varied. Great question. Um, and perhaps to follow on that, Russell asked, do we have a sense on how many people um, had a disability during the 1700s, 1800s? I have no idea. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I do not know. Um, you know, we have the statistics today that are approximately one in four or one in five Americans. It also depends on how you define disability. You know, I, I was giving a talk a couple of years ago to a small group at, um, this was before the pandemic, in person. It was a small group of um, small museums in the area talking about how to make their programming more accessible for people with disabilities. And I was talking a lot about how you should insist on using a microphone at public events so that uh, people who are deaf or hard of hearing uh, can, can hear easily, but that also benefits everyone. You know, I, I'm a hearing person, but if I'm far away, I can't, can't hear someone without a microphone or any sort of other amplification. And afterwards, someone came up to me who looked like a, an older gentleman. And he said to me, you know, microphones also benefit older people who are who can't hear as well. And I realized that he um, he didn't identify as disabled, but had uh, couldn't hear as well, just like maybe someone who might be deaf or hard as hearing and might identify as disabled or part of the deaf community. So um, it's a, a really interesting question about numbers. I don't have any for you. Uh, it depends on, you know, definitions, I think, in many cases. Uh, there's, some been, there's been some great scholarship on how much pain people were feeling in the past um, by 
uh, Elaine Foreman Crane. She's a historian who wrote a chapter in an edited volume. It's a scholarly volume, but it's a really interesting chapter. And it's a quotation from somebody and the title is a quotation from someone and the quotation is, I have suffered much today. And it's all about how much pain people experienced in the past. So there are many different ways you can think about that question. You know, what is disability? Did you identify as disabled um, or not? Um, and to, to folks viewing, if, um, if I'm asking your question and you would like to follow up with another question or a comment or just jump in, um, please feel free to, to take yourself off mute or to put a follow up in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, I've got another question from Joe, which is, was there any special help for disabled vets? And um, Joe, if you're thinking of a particular time period, feel free to, to pop that in there as well. Um, great question, Joe. If you're thinking maybe about uh, Revolutionary War veterans, since that's generally the time period I'm talking about, or you just came up on your, my screen, do you want I to do. clarify? <laughs> um, yes, I was thinking about the Revolutionary War and even the Civil War. Yeah, and, great question. Oh, go ahead. And, you know, whether or not there was any, I don't know, recognition of heroism as related to their disability and whether that altered people's perceptions about it, whether or not people were more inclined to be helpful and supportive, whether there was even any, um, you know, public uh, monetary support for, for, for people who were uh, injured in, in either of those wars. Great question. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Um, so uh, again, it depends. Um, the Revolutionary War time period is when we do start to see some um, state and federal assistance for disabled veterans. And that's also around the time period when you start to see the word, word disabled actually become more common in um, language to describe people with disabilities as we might describe them today. Uh, in terms of treating people differently, again, it depended on the situation. And my favorite example I use from this is that uh, I, I can't take credit for finding this source. Uh, my husband, who's also a historian, found it. He was reading the intake records of the almshouse in Philadelphia, and they, the clerk was describing a veteran who came in, and he described him as, and I'm paraphrasing, a one leg nuisance of a fellow, and then went on to say that he was um, a, an alcoholic or a drunk to, you know, to use the period term and just sort of a, a pain in the butt. Um, so <laughs> he, oh, he was also identified as a veteran, which I think is the relevant part there. <laughs> um, so it depends, but in the um, print culture, the prescriptive literature of the time period, the stories that kids read in the early 19th century, there are a lot of uh, instructions to children about how they should treat uh, veterans, uh, especially disabled veterans well, because they they fought for their, their freedom and their rights or however the, the book described it. So I sort of ran the gamut. I, I you know, I find that's particularly interesting because I know of at least one disabled person who will wear a marine cap and so forth, even though this was a disability from birth, um, in order to uh, get some respect uh, and, and it apparently still does make a difference to people. Um, oh, that's, that's really interesting. Yeah. Very interesting, huh? Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you and thanks, Joe. Um, so I'm I'm curious in sort of the description for your talk. You talk about a period, um, and throughout the course of the talk this evening, you're talking about a period in um, American history where folks were creating and sort of utilizing this assistive technology at home. Um, what did the transition to a more formalized, um, as you've called it, assistive technology industry look like, and when when does that start to take place? Great question. I mean, you know, everything happens in an overlapping fashion. And, you know, as I said, we have that website engineering at home showing that people are still improvising today. Um, when people started to go to specific makers for, say, a wheelchair um, or uh, a medicalized 
branded as such bedstead um, or even stuff branded uh, that's uh, with the word invalid. That starts as early as the late 18th century. Um, but I would say that by the mid to late 19th century is when it really becomes uh, more common and more accessible for more people. So people could, could order from catalogs from a distance for say an invalid bedstead rather than relying on being at home and making a, a large cradle to use. So it's, it's a super complicated question, but a, a really good one. And there's still, still lots of improvisation going on today at the same time, which is also really fun to think about. Thank you. Um, there was an observation in the chat um, from Deb, and Deb was thinking about the um, the painting of the unknown man in the wheelchair um, and, and looking at a few cues of um, visual cues there and thinking about stroke um, as a possibility. So Deb's got some, some observations there. Um, Thanks, Deb. Yeah, people, others have suggested that too. Yeah, ah, it was it was the handkerchief that made me think of a, a, a friend of mine and other people I've known with that just just you know incidentally always just kept it there to maintain their dignity and composure as they carry out their business. <laughs> yeah, th thank you for for bringing that up again, Deb. I will say, Emily, if I could add on to your question from earlier also, <laughs> I'm just thinking um, about artificial limbs. Mm. Um, artificial limbs were made in workshop settings through up until about the about World War I. So that's when artificial limbs, for example, became very medicalized and scientific. So it also depends on the object that you're, you're talking about. Makes sense. Um, you, had, you had mentioned the collection of crutches behind you um, <laughs> sure. at the beginning of the talk. <laughs> Don't have to, but I'd invite you if you wanted to chat about those, if there's a story or a history there. Oh, sure. Yeah. I started um, collecting what I study uh, when I first started my dissertation research. I never thought I'd be one of those people who collected what they studied for better or for worse, but I started seeing it out there. And in many cases, it was very affordable and it was just a good way to learn more and to acquire things that I could use for teaching purposes in particular or for settings like this. Um, one of my favorite crutches is uh, conveniently here from the last talk I gave. <laughs> um, this one is probably 19th century, early 19th century, which we know based on the design. And it's really cool because if you look really closely, you can see that it has a bunch of initials engraved on it. And um, we can speculate about why those initials are there. I think it might be because, well, there are a variety of different reasons. People could have shared this crutch. Um, they might have been signing it the way that we sign a, a, a cast today. Um, unclear. But there's a really cool example of a crutch at the um, Connecticut River Museum in Essex, Connecticut, where people uh, etched their initials into the crutch, said when and how they were injured and uh, included the date. And the history that goes along with the crutch is that this was used in a shipbuilding setting and that people on the docks would share it or use it whenever they got injured. So I think that's a really cool history and that crutch sort of reminded me of it and it's a possibility for how it might've been used and how helpful to historians later on to yeah, <laughs> try right. and date your stuff. That's great. A <laughs> um, couple more questions here. So following up on the sort of history of assistive technologies and that evolution there, are there records of the, the cost? Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of specific costs for, um, I didn't include any in my notes, so I can't speak off the top of my head. But for example, I can tell you that in the records of the Pennsylvania Hospital, there are instances where they noted how much they paid so-and-so craftsperson to provide a crutch or an artificial limb. Um, so those records do exist. I 
don't have any numbers in front of me, but I'd be happy to provide some of you have a specific uh, question about that. So yeah, you can find um, you can find those records, which is really neat. Um, another one here. Any idea when people began adapting entry and exit to homes and other buildings? Uh, that's a good question. Um, way before the Americans with Disabilities Act, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Um, probably the best historian to read on that would be Bess Williamson, who wrote a book called Accessible America. And uh, she focuses primarily on the 20th century, but talks a little bit about that history, especially in the 20th century. That said, there are examples that uh, predate that. So the big pension building in Washington, DC, that is now the National Building Museum was designed to be accessible for veterans who might be approaching the building, who might um, have difficulty climbing stairs, for example. So the stairs have a really, really low rise to provide you uh, one example of that. Um, I'm trying to think of other examples of building entrances. That's probably the most well-known one um, in houses. I don't think I've seen any, I feel like it seems to be more common that people might have been carried, for example, over a threshold. Um, but I, again, I would, I would point you to, to, to Bess's work for more on that. Thank you. And John just put a link there in the chat. Um, I think we have time for one or two additional questions if anybody would like to Pop anything else into the chat or take yourself off mute. Nicole, do you have a favorite, um, favorite find, favorite source, favorite object that you just didn't have time to, to fit into this talk? Oh, so many. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I'll also, I can also answer Liz's question about, I just saw it pop up about archival research. Um, but other stuff I haven't included that I really love, gosh, I don't know. Um, I mean, one of my favorite things to talk about is, is gout, which I referenced earlier. <laughs> um, and I, I'll use that as a way to answer Liz's question also. So. The reason I, I started studying gout and the objects that people use to live with and manage gout is I was in a research seminar when I was in grad school and uh, I was trying to find the right search terms because these early newspapers are fully searchable, which is really cool. Um, I was trying to find the right search terms to study disability history and the objects that people would have used. And very quickly, you know, I realized you can't use contemporary terms, obviously. Um, so I was trying to figure out what the period terms would have been. I started using invalid, which I knew was more of a 19th century term. Uh, but to my surprise, I found this advertisement for a four wheel carriage constructed for an invalid that was going up for auction in 1789. And it was associated with John Lukens, who was the surveyor general of Philadelphia, of Pennsylvania, excuse me. And I thought, well, this is really interesting. So then I did some more research and I went to his papers in the archive and found out that he had gout, which is, a, as I said, disabling form of arthritis. And then I was very lucky in that the person who wrote an article about carriage making in Philadelphia happened to mention this specific carriage in that are, and where it's listed in the account book at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. And the fact that it was listed as um, having been roomy and low to the ground. And so this was a way for, this is an example of Lukens having worked with his carriage maker to create what we would call today an accessible vehicle that he could have used to go around Philadelphia. Um, it was super expensive for the time period. It was $200. Uh, it would have been considered a pleasure vehicle and it, so it would have been taxed. Um, 
so that's a sort of a fun example of an object that no longer exists, but I think a lot about, and it, oh, it was light blue to give you a sense of, of what it looked like. <laughs> um, and other things, you know, I started telling people what I was researching and they said, oh, James Logan, you know, everyone studied James Logan for X, Y, and Z, but he also, we know, identified as a cripple. And that's just to use his, his period terminology. It's, you know, considered an offensive word to use today. Um, and so I just started going through his letters and looking for all the information that he wrote about uh, his disability. So lots of different ways, lots of people helped me and then also just luck in some cases. Well, thank you so much. Um, this is a really fascinating talk and thanks to all of you for your great questions. Um, I think you know, this gives us a really meaningful lens through which to continue examining the many lives of the people who have passed through the Longfellow House and hopefully for everybody who joined us tonight to look at look at history in your own lives as well. So um, it is just before seven o'clock. I would uh, like to invite folks to join us again um, very soon on uh, November 22nd for our next fall lecture. We're going to early in the week next week um, to accommodate the holiday. So if you'd like to join us on Monday, November 22nd, we will be with Dr. Lakshmi Krishnan talking about cosmopolitan Paris in the 19th century and the American clinical imagination. Um, thank you once again so very much to Nicole Bellolan. Uh, thank you to John Bell and the Friends of the Longfellow House, as well as to all of you. Um, I will uh, send out to everybody who registered this evening um, the link to the um, recording when that's available, as well as some of the resources that were shared this evening. Um, thank you all once again, and hope you have a wonderful night. Thanks so much. Stay strong. <laughs>